Okay, welcome back to another Natural Health 365 podcast. I feel like today is probably, I know I always say it, but you know, in all seriousness, I think this is probably one of the more important programs that we'll be putting together. I'm here today with Nikki. Nikki, we're going to talk a lot about emotions and how that affects all of us. So welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Great. So, Nikki, I know you just came off of an event where, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people are tuning in for your message. What is it right off the bat that you want to communicate to people that you feel is so important, you know? Yeah, so I just ran the Trauma and Mind Body Super Conference. We had over 200,000 attendees. It was a, a super successful conference. Everybody wanted to be involved. And I think the, the key message is really that your mind and body are one thing and what is going on for you emotionally and mentally is going to express physically in the body and not just that the the, phys the health of the physical body affects the, your mental health and emotional health as well so it's a bi-directional relationship but what we tend to ignore is just how important stress emotions especially trauma in childhood trauma and certain types of trauma which are much more prevalent and at epidemic levels than we all realized and um, we can talk a little bit more about a particular type of trauma which is is the one that's really um getting people and it, it's it's going to do things like make you less resilience resilient to things like infections exposure to heavy metals and things like that Oh, Nikki, I definitely want to talk about that because I, I'm thinking about a couple things. One, problematically speaking, so much of this is not talked about in the mainstream media, so a lot of people are clueless to it. But I think there's also that other element of uh, probably a blend of two things. One, I feel so alone. I'm the only one going through whatever it is you're about to go over with me. But also the fact that there's a bit of that embarrassment or shame blended into. And I know you just want to tear all of that down. So just talk to us about some of the things early on that you said something interesting that would actually increase our risk of, you know, getting victimized by these viral infections. Yes, yes. So there's a particular type of stress called early life stress. And it, it could it's also you could call it trauma in childhood. There's been huge studies done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. They were called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies. And they were literally looking at 17 and a half thousand adults. And what was very interesting about that particular study that I'm mentioning is that it was across the board. It wasn't just in my minority groups. It wasn't in low income groups. It was white middle class. It included everybody. And what they found is that there's a tremendous level of early life stress. Things like um, parents separating and divorce, um, um, physical, sexual or emotional abuse, physical or emotional neglect. Emotional neglect, by the way, is absolutely epidemic it, with all the our parents are out working and you know, they might look after us physically, but they don't often check in how we're doing emotionally. So we don't even know how we're feeling inside. Um, it can also be things like just troubles going on in the family. It could be substance abuse in the family. A family member is incarcerated. Um, all these, those sort of things. It's all the type of trauma, which is what we call relational. It's to do with our attachment relations. So it's not trauma due to a single discrete event, which would be what you could get a diagnosis of PTSD d4 post-traumatic stress disorder this is it's called developmental trauma and that is the one 17 half thousand adults surveyed 67 percent plus people said they had at least one ace adverse childhood experience that was a dramatic underestimate even the world experts said that's tip of the iceberg and the key thing to take away is that when you have a high level of early life stress, you have a dramatic increased risk of seven out of the top 10 causes of death, 400% increased risk of all the mental health uh, issues like dementia, Alzheimer's, um, anxiety, depression, and a six-fold increase of chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, eight times, if you've got eight ACEs, you eight times the risk of things like heart disease and all kinds of things. So it's, it's really bad news, dramatic increased risk. 
We also have, just to bear in mind, we have about 45 years of the study of something called psychoneuroimmunology, which is just looking at the link between our psychological state and the immune system. And if we're in a chronic state of stress, we are suppressing the immune system. We're making it too reactive to things. So we're getting sensitivities and inflammation. And on the other side, we don't have the same capacity to fight off bugs, infections, viruses. So certainly there's no question in my mind, that if you have adverse childhood events and a high level of them, you are going to be at higher risk of, you have less resilience to bugs like we're dealing with in this pandemic, no question. You know, I'm listening to, you you know, we hear in society, be happy, or you know that song, the old song, don't worry, be happy. And uh, we're all supposed to be so successful and happy on the outside. And yet, like what you're describing, if you don't feel like you were emotionally supported and, you know, you were a child, you went through this, like you say, very subtle, it's very low level, it's nothing that dramatic, like you got beaten, God forbid, you know, physically, but you have all that happen to you year in and year out. As you get older, if you don't just get over something like that, right, it really does transfer into so many other things, being depressed, feeling more alone in your life, all of these things, right? Absolutely. And you've made a really key point there. It's these, you know, death by a thousand cuts. It's these small, you know, even if you were verbally abused like day in, day out and there was no emotional connection. It's this thing called love. If there has to be a emotional love bonding connection between you and, you know, and t- you don't doesn't mean there's a lack of love just because somebody didn't beat you. It, it can be there's a lack of love and emotional connection with somebody. It's and how it's vitamin L, the love vitamin. That's what I call it. So most people are growing up with a vitamin L deficiency. They have self love deficit. If a parent wasn't able for whatever reason, you know, whether they were narcissistic or just didn't have it in their own childhood, so couldn't pass that on to the child that gets imprinted onto the child's psyche, onto the brain, onto the nervous system, onto the gut, onto the endocrine system, onto the immune system. So that child in the research showed has a lowered threshold to stress throughout the rest of their lifetime. So from the date they didn't get that loving sense of safety and that they were valuable and that they were lovable. And it, it's it's communicated to a child through the eyes it's obviously it's often not verbal a child isn't even thinking before age four it's to do with touch it's to do with the emotions that their parents feeling which the child would absorb and think it's their fault because a a child can't ever think that they are a a a good person in a bad environment it's never the environment they'll always turn it inwards and say there's something wrong with me if mum dad is depressed ignores me all the time something's wrong in this environment it gets turned inward so this gets it, it it's born into our identity so this is a different level of stress we talk about stress being like having too many emails running around looking after the kids you know too much to do we're talking about something much deeper than that it's something which gets it's who we are at the identity level and it drives personal personality drives or we become overgivers, overachievers. Um, it changes how we respond to stress over a lifetime. And that includes electromagnetic stress, chemical stress, toxic stress, stress, microbial stress, and also even how we're going to respond to discrete, adverse, traumatic events in childhood. So soldiers in the war who get PTSD there's a group that don't get PTSD and there's a group that did in in response to the same war zone what's the difference it was whether they had attachment trauma or not so it, it affects us at every level so that's what we were trying to bring attention to um so that people will start to think more deeply about build self awareness mindfulness and start to think about things that you know, stress, the word stress, which is wildly overused, to start thinking a little bit deeper about that as well. So let's dive a little deeper, Nikki. I mean, kind of you were reading my mind for a moment. It's like when people are out there now in adulthood, obviously those listening to this are past the age of four. I think it's fairly safe to say. And so, you know, the bottom line is, uh, is it about, am I oversimplifying it? I'll let you break it down. Becoming more aware, wow, my dad, my mom, they were busy. They didn't love me as much when I was young, like I could have been loved, or they didn't pay attention to me as much, or they, uh, 
they didn't encourage me or they didn't come along with me or or join me in any of the things that I was interested in, watch me. They didn't seem to be that interested. Is it about being aware of that and then just kind of working in that forgiveness, that letting go of it because of like what you said, hey, it was just the way they were raised and just move on with your life? I mean... At what point, how do you let go of that baggage so that you can live the kind of life that you really want to live, you know? Well, there's definitely step one is awareness and it it's confronting work. It to do this, it is confronting. It's confronting to to look at certain things that can be painful, to things that you didn't get your needs met as a child. It can be confronting about how that may have impacted you and who you've become today you may have been carrying around a chronic illness and you may start to realize wow that actually originated when I got really stressed from age six or seven or something like that so there's definitely it takes courage but that step one is you know becoming aware and there's some tools and we could talk dig into those a little bit there's questionnaires you can do there's Enneagram there's personality typing things that you can do if you're on a bit of the extreme end of certain personality types, it's usually making up for not feeling like you've got your needs met. So there's there's ways and tools to help you become really aware. Then there's there's actually getting in touch with the emotions that you have might have been hidden from you, the anger of, that you've been carrying around and been unconscious of because you didn't actually confront this before and realize that you really didn't get your needs met. So there's going to be a lot of unresolved anger. The idea is not to throw all that anger at the person who did it, who did it, because that's that's not going to get you anywhere. You do want to transmute and release the anger. And then you will come to you do the ultimate aim is to come to a place where you know, if it's been a lot of abuse, you come to the stage where you might want to be able to feel you can respect your abuser, but that you never are necessarily going to condone that behavior. And it doesn't mean you're going to condone what may have happened, but you do it because you want to be at peace. So I release, forgive, you could use that word as well, but not too soon. I release that so that I can be at peace. It's not about the other person at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, that person did the best job they could with the tools that they had as well. So there is that coming to resolution stage with that. It's, it takes that's quite a lot. That's the big picture. That's the kind of long term picture. But there are other that's part of the psychology side with early life stress, because it has such a physiological impact as well. People also don't want to forget all the functional medicine, the functional health stuff, nutrient deficiencies, gut health. A lot of people might not realize a lot of the imbalances they're dealing with, liver dysfunction, actually came from chronic long term stress from not being feeling safe inside as a child so you do want to address all that because it will help you feel more stable it'll help you feel more balanced emotionally less anxiety better sleep all circadian rhythm management all the good things that we think we talk about in the health community that will help you don't want to throw that stuff out it's very important you want to integrate that but don't forget to bring in some of the psychology aspects as well it's when you bring it all together that you get these this amazing synergistic virtuous spiral upwards you feel feel emotionally better so you do more for your physical health you do more for your physical health then you feel emotional better and then it goes up and up yeah i i couldn't agree with you more because i i've often said in a lot of my programs you can intellectually know i shouldn't have chocolate cake at night it's 10 o'clock at night maybe i just need to work on getting a good night's sleep and that's it goodbye but the point is you don't say goodbye to your refrigerator you kind of just stuff something in to fill a void because you are feeling an emotional pain, and that's what's driving you to eat poorly. So now for a lot of people, fixing the emotional issue, now you can kind of get like freed up and excited about just doing healthy things, and you don't get dragged down, right? Yeah, this is, you've made a really key point there, because... I mentioned the Enneagram, which is a, an, a personality typing system. And I've mentioned a few of the types being an achiever type, being an overgiver, uh, being a perfectionist. All these types of drives are basically it's vitamin L deficiency. And we're trying to either earn, we, we think we don't deserve love unconditionally. So we have to earn it. 
And unfortunately, when that gets a little out of control, because we feel like we're driven to do be overgivers, overachievers, we can't stop. That sabotages your health programs. That's the number one people reason. One of the number one reasons why people can't stick to a plan. Some of them will be directly eating their emotions. You know, it can be that kind of thing. But if you're a workaholic because you never feel good enough if you stop and do nothing, you're not going to be doing exercise. You're not going to be doing meditation. You're not going to be doing all the things that keep the mind body. In, in good health. Overgivers, there are tons of therapists, health coaches, therapists, psychology therapists, the overgivers, they're the ones that learnt that when they give to others, they get love because they didn't get it unconditionally, unfortunately. Tons of them are all the overgiver types. When that goes too far, they end up in burnout and then they end up helping everybody else and then they get to the stage where they end up with a chronic illness. We see this all the time within when you start looking for it. If you're not looking for it, you won't see the patterns. But that's a, a crucial point that you've made. That's It's one of the things of why you want to look into that side of things. There could be something much deeper happening that, you know, you, you know what to do, but you just can't get yourself to do it. And that's where the psychology and the emotional side comes in. And when you start to just awareness, by the way, starts to what you look at disappears, you know, and if you're completely unaware of a behavior, you can't change something. So the step one is, is that, too. So it's a really good point. So why don't we touch on something where I, I'm thinking of people who are struggling physically because they have serious emotional issues. But if you bring up the subject, no, 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 I don't want to I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk about it. Is your quick answer? There's nothing you can do, because what I'm saying is, what would you say to family members that actually suffer knowing that this person needs to deal with things on an emotional level to feel better. They're watching it go down, Nikki. But there's, I mean, what, what do you tell them or what can you possibly say to that person who seems so closed off? How do you deal with a situation like that when you're absolutely certain? I'm talking about the person that has done medical testing, all kinds of special diets, blah, blah, blah. None of it has helped. And you know there's some serious emotion, emotional issues that need to be dealt with. What do you say in that situation? Well, that's, yeah, that's a trick. That's another tricky one. It's always, they say, what is it? Don't don't get involved with your fa- trying to treat your family members as a health practitioner. I mean, there's, there's right. that side. Some of it can just be, you know, if that person, if quite honestly, if they're sick enough, some people aren't sick enough. I know that sounds awful, but it, when it really gets to the point where they're about to lose everything, then they're like desperate. And uh, some people aren't desperate enough. That's, it's, but that's the truth. Some people just won't go there until it's so bad. Um, other people, you know, they're a little bit more open and you can start to sort of drop in tools and resources like maybe it's a video about adversity in childhood. Maybe it's a book. Uh, Donna, Donna Jackson Nakazawa's book is a great book. Um, childhood Disrupted, for example. So you could sort of sort of drop in, uh, you know, videos. There's My website's got a free A score thing. So, you, you know, that's how I've dealt with with some of it. Sometimes, you know, some people are just very blocked and they're getting, I hate to say it, but they're getting a secondary gain from the illness. So the illness is, they actually are just going to go to practitioner to practitioner to practitioner and don't ever want to look at the true source of the problem because um, they they really don't want to look at that. And it's it, the illness, therefore, is just in some way serving them. So there's a sort of secondary gain. I think there's a great book, um, Caroline Mice, who's actually on our summit, you know, Why People Don't Heal. That's a great book for, to recommend to somebody who's like might want to look at the attitude side of things. Um, and then other times, you know, it's just being gentle and having people read books. There's a brilliant book. I'm just giving your audience some resources here, especially things like emotional neglect. Very difficult to self-report that to know that because it's not about it's not what happened in childhood. It's what didn't happen. So sometimes somebody just doesn't know what's wrong. They just don't feel right. Um, and it's absolutely epidemic. John East's, Dr. John East Webb's book, uh, it's called Running on Empty. 
that there's a questionnaire and she's got a website you could uh, I think you have to opt in to get a questionnaire I really recommend that as well for people where you you do it and then you'll read it and go oh my gosh that's that's the person's issue and it's a t- I've had so many people come to me and say that was a life-changing book and questionnaire and John Eastie's work is exploding right now because it's needed this emotional intelligence is people don't know how to name their emotions don't know what they're feeling if you can't do that you can't understand what the emotion is trying to tell you and it's hard to release it so it's a key part in this process where we talk we can talk more about transmuting emotions which is like the next stage as well yeah why don't we go into that now go ahead yes so that that's kind of would be the next stage is like confronting being aware that you might need to investigate and then you find out it's like oh okay i'm feeling really strong feelings there's um you then want to sort of understand emotions are always true. They're not always right, but um, they're always the truth of you. And they'll tell you exactly how you're feeling about every situation that you've ever had in your life. So um, and that's really useful and important information. That's your sense of self. That's your uh, you know, if you're not emotionally aware or connected to your own feelings, you can end up doing careers that aren't meant for you. You can end up being with people who aren't meant for you either. So it's this process of a lot of us have disconnected. We've intellectualized because we've escaped to our head because it wasn't good. The feelings we had aren't good. Or we spiritualize things. We do the spiritual bypass. We intellectualize. Um, there's a lot of different ways we avoid feeling our emotions. So the next stage is actually start to feel your emotions, dive right in. So you can do that with, um, if you're somebody who intellectualizes a lot and spiritually bypasses, you want to do work which gets you back in your body and into the feeling side again. So I get people doing yoga. I don't recommend meditation necessarily for those people because we actually want them to to stop bypassing. So um, physical work, um, it, Tai Chi is very good for that type as well. Yoga, body work, massage, and a lot of breathing work. So when you start to, and then all the emotions start to come up, and then memories start to come up too, and then you start to know yourself in a way that maybe you have been disconnected from, and then you can start to learn about what the emotions mean. What are, what do they mean to you? What does it say about what you your true desires are, the authentic self? Are you in a situation now which is actually not supportive of you? And then you get the information to make life decisions. And then you can also deal, you can work with the emotions either through writing, journaling, um, you know, even writing out, you know, sometimes having someone journal about somebody who's been abusive to them, like I mentioned, like doing affirmations to repeat over and over again. I respect you and I release you. I don't condone the behavior, but I'm doing this to be at peace. To say this again and again on a daily basis, eventually that emotion will release and move out. But emotions like depression, guilt, shame, anger, fear, they've each got an important message for you that will help you navigate in one, how to not feel it anymore because it's, it's now being heard. It's not having to bang at the door all the time. So when you're exploding at the kids and you can't quite understand why you're so overreactive, it's like you're carrying this big suitcase of anger from childhood that was still around your neck that you haven't confronted yet and realized, wow, I had a really tough time. And that's what that emotion was trying to tell me. So emotions aren't bad. They're not scary. People think that if they dive into an emotion that they'll never get out. And it just that's not physically psychologically possible um you know that's not to say that in certain severe cases of severe depression and so on like that you should seek out appropriate professional medical help i would say that but um a lot of emotions once you start to confront them feel them again and start to tune into the messages that's when this solution and the resolution starts as well so is it always something where somebody does have to confront it You know, when somebody has this emotional issue, is there no way around it that they have to really go through this sort of, I guess, in what a lot of people would think uh, a very traumatic moment in their life? They're going to have to confront these things. It's going to feel very difficult. Uh, how, How do you put it to people, you know, as to what they can expect? Yes, it's a good point. So it depends uh, now, certainly, if it's been a very serious and a traumatic event from the past, we certainly don't want to do anything which re-traumatizes people. And if it's, a, it's a very, like a big tree T trauma, it might have been, say, sexual abuse or something like that, I would definitely work with a practitioner. If it was a discrete event, by the way, like an assault or something like that, the top line intervention for that is EMDR, 
eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's widely available in conventional medicine. It's backed by lots of good practitioners around. You can find good practitioners. You just put EMDR and they will release it. The beauty of MD EMDR, it's an energy psychology. And all you're going to do is some eye movements. And, and basically, they'll they'll have you work through it in a, an extremely safe way so that you're not going to face having to be re-traumatized or anything like that. So that's very important if it's something that you are afraid of having to relive work with a professional who can who can help you through those kind of events very important for the rest of us who are just it's not sort of something that's going to overwhelm us or re-traumatize us it's just facing up to like oh it's actually much more depressing than I thought kind of thing there is a, an emotional detox process to go through and but it's you know, it doesn't there's very uh, non re traumatizing again ways to release emotions and there's also ways we can speed that up a lot of people don't realize that when you work energetically purely energetically with emotions People don't realize things like lemon baths. When I work with a client and I've mobilized a lot of emotions, I can do it through sound therapy as well, by the way. I'll have them do a lemon bath. It's just a 30 minute bath with three lemons. You have to you have to um, soak the lemons for an hour. And it's amazing how it will neutralize the intensity of anything you're feeling. And I've got about 12 things that help people release the emotions faster it's people don't even know about how emotions how we detox emotionally like yes if you're actually going through a releasing process the emotions do come up and they are they often do need to be felt a little bit to be released but you start to just come to, you get used to it and you kind of go oh I'm feeling a bit sad for no reason it seems like no reason I'm feeling sad today oh I did that energy clearing and faced that issue yesterday it's a bit of sadness and it's gone within a day or two and there's ways to speed it up a lot of hydrotherapy by the way emotions get stored in the waters of the body and when we purge out the waters it speeds up the emotional detox so i have whole protocols i do with that too how important is it nikki so many times with a lot of these things like you're describing not feeling loved you know verbal abuse you're too fat you're too slow you'll never amount to anything this kind of stuff from close family members you kind of were experiencing that for years and now you're older you know, maybe your parents aren't alive anymore. You know, it's kind of like you're distant from when that happened to you, but it's still in effect. How important is it to really work with someone that you trust, that you really care about? Uh, I think that's, that is also very important. If you choose to work with a professional to work through those issues, it's very important to absolutely choose somebody you feel very comfortable with. And you can be picky. You're the one, if, if you're in a professional relationship, be picky. And if, if there's, do a free 15-minute chat if that practitioner offers that. I would pick ones that are, were able to give that to you and connect in with them. And do you feel comfortable? How do they feel to you? Do they resonate with you? And if at any time you're feeling uncomfortable or they said something, Something which is not appropriate for you that you feel is the case move on and find somebody that is um, safe is going to be fit, helping you to feel safe so um, yes there's the then there's plenty of help to do that out there picking the right therapist um, but yeah it so there's a few uh, good important rules to follow with that too so Nikki I mean You've said so much, and I don't think it's overwhelming. I don't mean it like that at all. I think this was super helpful information. But if somebody, you know, like I, I often think when, when you were talking today, you know, the, the, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. So you got to be open to this. So the bottom line is if somebody wanted to just kind of like, this is it for me, I've got to get into this, this is a big issue for me, where can they go to get more information from you and and really start, you know, getting a little bit more serious about this, you know? Yeah, so they're very welcome to come to my website. You can start with, there's actually a tab um, called ACE score. So you can start to do the extended, so just start with the basic ACE questionnaire. And then there's an extended sort of questionnaire on there as well. And I include some of the resources. There's a free ebook on there, which includes resources like where would you find out about the Enneagram type or the book like Running on Empty and so on. Some of those resources that I've sort of started to talk about, that's, a start point as well I do have a free downloadable meditation a guided self-love meditation on my website so people can start doing that I get the testimonies I have from that meditation are amazing just to start it's it works at the unconscious level but also the music and the energy transmission it's a transmission of love energy and it's reprogramming the unconscious so I recommend if people start doing that 30 minutes a day it's free to download 
And um, so there's tons of resources and I am launching my emotional detox program starting in August. So that's a big program where people get to work with me one to one. I look at everything I look at because I'm kind of an emotional empath. I can go through a whole set of emotions and say, right, you've got you're carrying around this many hours of work to do on anger, depression, shame. And literally I go through the list that they may need to transmute and work through. But I also I go through all their physiological imbalances, potentially potential imbalances as well so if they got hormone imbalances do they have pyroluria do they have nutrient deficiencies that have resulted from all this stress do they need to do gut work um this kind of thing so it's a very comprehensive program there's lots of videos that people can work on on their own but they get some consultations with me in that program as well but i work with sound therapy so i teach people to use a, a tuning fork with my meditations and using intention they can intend to transmute the emotions that uh, that we've identified they need to work on so um that's launching in august as well we could all use a little bit more love nikki for sure and uh definitely lose a lot of negative emotional baggage no doubt thank you so much for being with us today nikki i really appreciate you thank you so much jonathan for having me it's been awesome thank you